Our speaker this evening is Vern Benham Grimsley, a Phi Beta Kappa graduate in philosophy and psychology from the University of Kansas. Mr. Grimsley is a former psychology researcher for the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and his broadcasting schedule has taken him to colleges and universities from coast to coast. The powerful Radio Free Europe and the AFRN network have beamed his commentaries behind the Iron Curtain in six languages. His inspiring radio broadcasts are heard by over 100 million people annually on over 1,000 stations in all 50 of the United States and around the world, including Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, the Middle East, and even in China. Vern combines his personal philosophy and experiences with up-to-the-minute discoveries in scientific psychology. I am pleased to present to you our featured speaker for this evening, Mr. Vern Benham Grimsley, and his topic, The Psychology of Exuberant Living. Let's give a warm Grand Junction applause for Vern Grimsley. Thank you, President. Suplicio, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for that kind applause. I once heard a famous preacher give a speech. He was introduced, and the crowd clapped. He began by saying, when an audience applauds before they've heard any of the speech, he said, that's faith. He said, if they clap in the middle of a speech, that's hope. And he said, if you're still applauding at the end, it'll be charity. <laughs> I am moved by your manifestation of faith this evening. Last summer, I was talking with Walter Cronkite of CBS News. He told me that on one occasion, he was invited to be the closing speaker at a Memorial Day commemoration in Washington, D.C. He said he received a letter from the program chairman. It read, Dear Mr. Cronkite, we're going to begin the program with music by the Marine Corps Band. Next, an address by Senator Edward Kennedy. Then a recitation by an Eagle Scout. Next, your speech, and then the firing squad. <laughs> He said that he went anyway. <laughs> I asked your president how long I should talk tonight. He said, you can talk as long as you want to, but we're all leaving in 45 minutes. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. But I remember one time I was speaking at the old Mulebach Hotel in Kansas City, and people were sitting out finishing their banquets. Master of Ceremonies leaned over to me and said, Vern, should we let them enjoy themselves a little longer? <laughs> Or do you want to begin your speech right away? <clears throat> Another time after I'd spoken, a man came up to me and said, Vern, I could have sat and listened to you all night. I said, well, thank you. He said, and for a while there, I thought I was going to. <laughs> Another time after I'd spoken, a little woman came up to me and said, Vern, that was a wonderful speech, absolutely superfluous. <laughs> I said, why, thank you. I hope to have it published posthumously. <laughs> she said, well, I do hope that will be very soon. <laughs> Another time I'd given a speech the night before, next morning I was out in front of my hotel putting my luggage in the car. A teenage boy came up to me on the sidewalk and said, Mr. Grimsley, I want to shake your hand. I really enjoyed your lecture last night. I said, thank you. Then I looked him up and down and said, but I don't recall seeing you at my lecture last night. He said, no, I wasn't there. I said, well, how could you enjoy it so much? He said, well, I bought my girlfriend's parents two tickets and they both went. <laughs> but my favorite introduction story of all, don't stop me if you've heard this one, I want to hear it again myself. About Lyndon Johnson, when he was president of the United States, he used to tell this story that the most flowery introduction he ever received was one time when he was invited back to his home state of Texas to address the Texas State Legislature in Austin. And he said on this occasion he was given the most flowery introduction. They introduced him as Texas' greatest son, the man of the hour, the hope of the nation and the world. Johnson came to the microphone and said, I only have one regret tonight, that my parents were not here to hear that introduction. He said for two reasons. My father would have been proud of it. And my mother would have believed it. <laughs> well, I'm delighted to be here tonight in Grand Junction, gateway to Orchard Mesa. <laughs> my topic tonight is the psychology of exuberant living. 
When I was a boy 13 years old, my grandfather entered me in a national championship shooting contest held in Kansas City. Hundreds of expert marksmen from all over the country were there that day, many of them full-time professional shooters. So you can imagine my feeling of chagrin and disappointment when the very first clay target came sailing out before me. I drew a careful bead on it with my 12-gauge shotgun, pulled the trigger, hopefully, expectantly, and nothing happened. I didn't so much as chip it. I missed the target completely. Now, each shooter was to fire at 100 of these targets. Here, I'd missed my very first one. I still had 99 to go. <laughs> and I remember I stood there at my mark, waiting for the other men in my squad to take their turns. I struggled with a feeling of discouragement. It would have been so easy to think to myself, this just isn't my day. What am I doing here anyway? I'm only a 13-year-old kid. Some of these men have been shooting 20, 30, 40 years longer than I have. I missed my first target. I have 99 to go. I knew in that moment that I very simply faced one of those choices, such as we all do at times, between determination and despair. But that day, as a personal experiment, I decided to choose determination. To go ahead and give that contest everything I had in concentration, purpose, intensity. Well, I ended up missing only two more targets, concluding with a final score of 97 out of 100, won that match, Won the brand new shiny automobile, it was first prize. Even though I was only 13 years old and legally too young to drive it, it became our family car. Sports Illustrated magazine sent a reporter out to do a picture story on me, and I was even included in Ripley's Believe It or Not. Now, I tell this story from my personal background because it was for me a vivid moment of learning a tremendous psychological principle that if you can control your inner thoughts, feelings and attitudes, you can all the better deal with the circumstances and the situations of life. I know that if mentally I'd given up when I missed that first target, there would have been no way on earth I could have gone on to win that match. Here's the principle. There are no such things as hopeless situations. There are only individuals, men and women, people who have grown hopeless about their situations. And this is a marvelous principle in what I call the psychology of exuberant living. That word exuberance is from the Latin ex, meaning in this case full or complete, and uberare, meaning to bear fruit. Did I pronounce that right? Uberare, to bear fruit <laughs> in abundance. And listen to the definition of exuberance. The psychological definition of it is abounding in high spirits and vitality, full of joy and vigor. In my years as a psychology researcher for the National Science Foundation in Washington, I came to the conclusion that all of us possess the potential to live more exuberantly, that human beings were created and intended not merely to exist. A stone or a pebble at the side of the road exists. Garbage can exist. But we were created and intended to live abounding in high spirits and vitality, full of joy and vigor. Well, now some people say, I can't do that. They say, my moods fluctuate all the time. Say, sometimes I feel like I'm on cloud nine. Most of the time, I feel like all nine clouds are on me. <laughs> One old farmer said, I feel lower than a rattlesnake's instep. <laughs> One fellow said, sometimes I feel so low, I have to reach up to touch bottom. <laughs> or people say they worry all the time. There was a great study done of worry at Princeton University a few years ago. They studied thousands of people and the things they worried about then went on to study how many of the things those people worried about through the years actually took place. Here were the results. They found on the average 40% of the things people worried about never ever took place at all. Nearly half the things just didn't happen. Another 30% of the things people worried about they found nothing could be done one way or the other about those things anyway. Nothing could be done, so why worry about it? What makes sense about worrying about something? We can't affect it in any way. Another 22% of the things people worried about, upon honest analysis, the worriers had to admit it wasn't going to matter much one way or the other. What did happen? These were fundamentally trivial things. So that's 92% of human worry, which either is not going to happen at all, couldn't be prevented, worrying about something couldn't be prevented, or is fundamentally trivial, doesn't amount to much. That leaves only 8%. Even then, you have the choice whether to worry about that 8% or pray about it and approach it with an affirmative attitude of life. Remember, I was giving a speech in Seattle one night, and a woman came up and told me that she'd learned a psychological secret for conquering the worry habit. She said she learned it when her husband was in the hospital. 
And every day she found herself stewing and filled with anxiety about whether his test results would come out well, whether the doctors and nurses would treat him properly and so forth. Finally, she said she sat herself down in the chair and said to herself, honey, you procrastinate about everything else. <laughs> procrastinate about worrying, too. Just put it off till later like you do with everything else. <laughs> Our grandfather said, he said, Vern, there's a lot of cactus in the world, but you don't have to sit on it. <laughs> Listen, halitosis is better than no breath at all. <laughs> Some people say, but I can't be exuberant. I, I don't like problems. They bother me. They upset me. I say, anybody who doesn't like problems, go out and take an inspirational walk through a cemetery somewhere. <laughs> Thousands of people out there don't have any problems, but... They're all dead. Because problems are a sign of life. <laughs> Literally, problems are a sign of life, psychologically, inwardly, spiritually. I was talking with the president of one of the largest corporations in the United States. I said, what do you think, looking at this decade of the 80s, is necessary to be a success in business? He thought for a moment, he said, I can think of two things right away. Number one, he said, have to keep your mind cocked, be thinking and planning all the time. Number two, he said, you have to enjoy solving problems. He didn't just say, tolerate it put up with it, endure it. He said, actually enjoy it and wake up every morning and spit on your hands and say, what dragons are there to wrestle today? What problems are there to solve? A friend of mine in the entomology department at the University of Kansas told me one time he was watching a little ant crawling along across the ground and was carrying on its back a piece of straw about three times longer than the ant was. Suddenly this ant came to a crack in the soil, which must have appeared to the ant to be a vast chasm of some sort, an impassable barrier. It pondered this obstacle for a moment, then proceeded to take the piece of straw off its back, laid it across the crack in the soil, walked across on the piece of straw, picked it up, and went on its way. I love that as an example of what psychology has found, that the really creative people are the ones who have learned to turn burdens into bridges. They see the potentials in a problem. The difficulties possess the seeds of their own solutions. The year 1867, William H. Seward was Secretary of State. And the United States purchased Alaska from Russia for the price of two cents per acre. And many people call this Seward's folly because Alaska was widely regarded to be this worthless wasteland of ice and snow. Why would we want to buy Alaska, people thought. But that was before we had begun the full exploration of it. And began to find it was rich in forests and fishing, oil, mineral resources. We have that great Alaska pipeline now coming down. All that remained was to explore it. In the same way, in our own mental lives, our psychological lives, our spiritual lives, one of the most exciting things we can do is to begin to explore this uncharted terrain, this unmapped territory of the inner life. Decision-making, problem-solving. In the year 1910, Roald Amundsen, the famed Norwegian explorer, set sail determined to be the first man to reach the North Pole. He dreamed of this all his life. Imagine his feeling of disappointment when he received word that Admiral Robert E. Perry had just successfully reached the North Pole ahead of him. At that point, he could have given up, but Roald Amundsen decided right then and there, even if he couldn't be the first man to reach the North Pole, he still could be the first man to reach the South Pole. And one year later, in December of 1911, he accomplished that new goal. This is what Leland Stanford, the Stanford University founder, described as flexible tenacity. When one door closes, go look for another one. Maintain an openness of thought and creativity. In the 1800s, when railway locomotives first achieved the record speed of 30 miles an hour, the Munich Germany College of Physicians and Surgeons issued a dire warning to the world that traveling 30 miles an hour in a train would probably cause vision impairment and blindness. <laughs> in England, the Royal College of Surgeons issued a warning that traveling 30 miles an hour in a train would probably cause mental illness, insanity. They were wrong. Does the name Joseph Lalande mean anything in particular to anyone here tonight? Probably not, yet he was an eminent French scientist in his day who wrote papers conclusively proving that manned aircraft flight was totally impossible. Then came the Wright brothers. Think of the things people said we could never do, everything from splitting the atom to landing on the moon to the space shuttle. The least memorable names down through the annals of human history are the people who've 
said things couldn't be done. We do not erect our monuments, our statues, our memorials to the skeptics and the doubters and the naysayers, but to the men and women who have some vision, some dream, some ideal, and then who dare to pursue it. These are the great and luminous personalities of human life who follow a dream. At Harvard University, they did a fascinating study with a dynamometer, a laboratory calibrated gripping device, like one of these things you see in a penny arcade, you know, put in a nickel and try your strength of grip. Took a number of men off the street, had them squeeze this thing as tightly as they could. Their average strength of grip was 101 pounds. Then, under hypnosis, these same men were given the thought or the suggestion in their minds that they were weak and feeble, that they could not grip strongly. Again, told to squeeze as tightly as they could. This time, their average strength of grip fell from 101 pounds down to only 29 pounds. Again, under hypnosis, same men were told they were mighty men of steel. They were going to exert their full strength of grip. Again, they squeezed as tightly as they could. This time, their strength of grip, on the average of all of them, increased from that low of 29 pounds, clear up to about 160 pounds, far exceeding their first best effort of 101 pounds. That's only one of countless examples proven in the psychology laboratory of how our range of human potential is either limited by skepticism and doubt or released by an affirmative attitude. And this is even true of our emotions. I'll never forget the afternoon in April of 1974, I was driving along a freeway in San Francisco, listening to a baseball game on the radio. Suddenly, the crowd in that stadium went backflipping, headstanding, somersaulting wild, because that was the afternoon Henry Aaron hit home run number 715. He beat Babe Ruth's old all-time home run record of 714, remember? And the two NBC sports casters, Kurt Gowdy and Joe Garagiola, nearly swallowed their microphones. They went into a frenzy. No, they went into two frenzies, one for each of them. For minute after minute, they were shouting and yelling, celebrating, took me back to my dad, who was a coach of football and basketball in western Kansas, and how you'd go to a game, and respectable, upstanding citizens of the community would stand up and yell and shout themselves hoarse when we scored. And if we won a game or a tournament, sometimes build a big bonfire out on Main Street and celebrate. I thought, we celebrate when the team scores, somebody sets a world record. I thought, how few people have I ever met in my life who celebrate life itself, who celebrate it. The fact that we have breath in our nostrils and a pulse at our wrists and heartbeat under our breastbone, that too is to be celebrated, to be delighted in. One of the most exuberant men I ever knew in my life was Lowell Thomas, the dean of American broadcasters. For 50 years, the voice of CBS radio and at 85, he was still doing cross-country skiing, mountain climbing, giving lectures, booked by this same Franklin agency for whom I'm speaking this evening, doing television programs. An exuberant man. I had supper with Lowell Thomas two weeks before he died in Washington, D.C. You know, the secret of his entire philosophy was summarized in a little plaque on the wall of his den. It read from the Old Testament scriptures, this is the day which the Lord hath made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. And anybody who gets up with that kind of attitude in the morning is going to have a different kind of day than somebody who doesn't. The secret of happiness certainly isn't material. I know it isn't money. A friend of mine, an old banker back in Kansas, said money isn't the secret of happiness. He said you can be just as happy with $3 million as you can with 5 or $6 million as it is money. <laughs> No, it's in the inner attitude. The way you look at things. Old fellow south of my hometown, Doogie Fisher, went into the doctor for an examination. At the end of the examination, the doctor said, Doogie, I'm happy to tell you you're going to live to be 90. Doogie said, but I am 90. <laughs> doctor said, well, see what I tell you. It's all in the attitude. Now, you can carry positive thinking to an extreme. You can two trainees for the astronaut program, I understand we're talking. One of them said to the other one, he said, we've already been to the moon. Everybody's going to be going to the moon. He said, what we ought to do next? We ought to go straight directly to the sun. Bevis <laughs> says, wait a minute, wait a minute. He says, we get within a thousand miles of the sun and we start to melt. Person thinks to me, he says, so we go at night. <laughs> Thank you.
That's carrying it too far. That's extreme. Have another example out in California. A few years ago, I bought a house. And the real estate salesman who was showing me around, he was a real positive thinker. <laughs> he was. He could see the possibility in anything. He showed me one house. He explained to me I could keep the swimming pool filled just by pumping the water out of the basement every week. That's... <laughs> It's extreme. That's in the attitude. Visitor from Texas seeing a friend of his in New York. New Yorker took him to see Niagara Falls. I said, I bet you haven't got anything like that back in Texas. I said, no, but we've got a plumber back home who can fix it. <laughs> Too many people fixing the blame, not enough people fixing the problems. My grandmother used to make what she called enthusiastic stew. I asked her why she called it that one time. She said, because I put everything I have into it. <laughs> you know that word enthusiasm is from the ancient Greek en and theos, and it means literally God within or filled with God. And the old Greek philosophers believed that enthusiasm was a spiritual gift bestowed upon human beings to enable us to deal with the difficulties of life more effectively, to give life all we've got and realize we're entitled to it. Man went to a doctor for an examination. Different man, different doctor. <laughs> doctor says, the best thing, at the end of the examination, the best thing for you, so it would be, if you give up smoking, stop your drinking. Give up all sweets, starches, and fattening foods. Man sat there and thought for a minute, said, Doc, said, I don't deserve the best. <laughs> I said, I don't deserve the best. I said, what's second best? <laughs> it is true. There are people who go through decade after decade of their lives with the inner conviction convinced that they really don't deserve the best. They don't deserve to be happy and fulfilled. I say we're entitled to it as part of our spiritual and psychological birthright as children of God to be excited, fascinated by life, to have an active mental life. According to psychology, most of us use only about 10% of our mental capacity in a lifetime. That's what psychology has been saying. I talked to Professor Charles Brackett of Harvard University, famed brain surgeon, neurosurgeon. I said, what do you think about that estimate that most people use only 10% of their mental capacity in a lifetime? He said, it's a vast overestimate. <laughs> he said, most people don't use that much. That's like living in one tiny broom closet of a great, huge mansion, waiting to be explored. I knew a foreman for a factory, big company, having terrible problems in his department. One day, he received a memo from the company president, totally changed this man's attitude. The memo read, Quote, be glad for all the problems in your department. Because if they weren't such big problems, someone else with less ability would have your job. <laughs> One of the great statements I read in my study of the history of philosophy, taking a degree in philosophy, was from Epicurus, the ancient Greek, who wrote, the greater the difficulty, the greater the glory in surmounting it. Skillful ship captains, listen to this, I love this. Skillful ship captains gain their reputations not from placid seas, but from storms and tempests. What a marvelous philosophic thought. The most influential historian of the 20th century, Professor Arnold Toynbee of England, described his entire theory of human history in two words, challenge and response. And Toynbee said that this is true of civilizations, of cities, of nations, of states, of individuals. That they've risen historically to their highest heights of achievement and accomplishment, not when things have been easy. No, but responding to some great challenge, some difficulty, some sort of problem. 1975, Billie Jean King won at Wimbledon tennis tournament. And some historians said it was the most blazing women's tennis ever played. That was before she'd had some of her knee surgery and some of her other problems as well. Sports reporters gathered around Billie Jean King and said, what was your mental psychological attitude going into this tournament that enabled you to play so startlingly, so blazingly? She said, I wrote myself a letter. And she took it out. She said, I carried this around in my purse or in my pocket during the entire Wimbledon tournament. 
She showed the reporters a letter. It said, Dear Billie Jean King, written to herself, even if you get 20 bad calls in a row, even if the sun is in your eyes, the wind is against you, and if everything possible goes wrong, go ahead and give it everything you've got, even when you think you've got nothing more to give. Signed, Billie Jean. And that's how she won at Wimbledon. And her opponent, Chris Everett, whom she defeated, said she's a real champion because she plays her best when she's down. Again, challenge and response. I was giving a pep talk to our staff at Worldwide Broadcasting Network, San Francisco, of which I'm president broadcasting around the world. I said, I want you to remember, I said to the staff, that in broadcasting, as in life itself, there are no such things really as problems. There are only opportunities. Look at it that way. Next morning, my vice president came in and said, Vern, we've just encountered an insurmountable opportunity. <laughs> but that's not oratory. That's not just rhetoric. When I say problems or opportunities, I mean it is true. Think of it. The problem of darkness and poor illumination was a kind of opportunity in the mind of Thomas Alva Edison for the invention of the incandescent lights. The problem of our inability to communicate over distances rapidly was a kind of opportunity in the mind of Marconi for the invention of the wireless, radio, now television, of course. The problem of our inability to transport goods and people over vast distances quickly was an opportunity in the minds of the Wright brothers for the invention of the airplane. The problem of ignorance was a kind of opportunity for the development of great educational systems. The problem of our inability to keep an accurate record of time was the opportunity for the invention of chronographs, chronometers. I'm wearing one of the astronaut watches. This was designed for the moon flight, for the walk on the moon. Incredibly accurate. And yet, it began as a problem. So problems literally are opportunities. That's the first thing I want to say about them. The second thing I want to say is problems can be and ought to be and can become, to a person who learns the psychology of exuberant living, enjoyable. I said enjoyable. I had a fascinating discussion with the head of the American Anthropological Society, Dr. Sherwood Washburn. And he mentioned a new finding in anthropology, this was several years ago, that started me thinking. He said there's one game they found that children everywhere on Earth play. This one game. Can anybody guess what that game would be? Just shout it out. Tag. Somebody said tag. Hide and, seek. Hide and seek. That's it. That's it. Everywhere on Earth. <laughs> everywhere on Earth they found. From the polar ice cap areas to the islands of the seas. China, Arabia, everywhere, little children, as if some traveling kindergarten teacher had gone around teaching them all how to play this game, they play the game of hide-and-go-seek. Well, that was interesting enough in itself. But I kept thinking about it. About the next day, I began to wonder what could be so universal about that game. Why would little children play it everywhere? And it dawned on me, it occurred to me, it's a simple form of a problem-solving game. The child who is going to hide has the problem of going and hiding someplace where it won't be found. The child who's going to seek has the problem of going out and finding the child who's hiding. And then I said, well, wait a minute, that's what we do every time we have recreation. And practically everything we do for fun is some form or another of established problem solving. That's what we do for recreation. Football is the problem of getting that ball across the goal line. Basketball, the problem of getting the ball through the hoop. Baseball, the problem of hitting the ball, running the bases. Some teams have a bigger problem with it than other teams. <laughs> <laughs> I just knew we'd agree. <laughs> Some of those other teams. Marbles, it's, it's the problem of shooting somebody's marbles out of the ring. And checkers, and chess, and canasta. And bridge, and po you, you can't think of a game that doesn't involve some sort of problem solving. Crossword puzzles. Some people say they can't stand to work the checkbook every month. <laughs> we'll sit around and work crossword puzzles all weekend. Now, what's the difference? You define the one task as work, the other one as fun. If the bank sent you crossword puzzles you had to work every month, wonder how many people would enjoy it as much. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. We define something as going to be fun or it's going to be work. That's the way it turns out to us. What we do for fun is some form or another problem solving. Golf. Golf, what an example. <laughs> the game of golf consists of the problem of putting a little ball an inch and a half in diameter or so 
on top of this huge ball, thousands of miles in diameter. <laughs> and then trying to hit the little one. Without hitting the big one. <laughs> and then driving the little one into some holes that you've drilled in the big one. <laughs> but the solving of that enormously complicated problem we call fun. So I had a great time. I went out and played golf today. Anytime I get the urge to play golf, I just throw an aspirin out on the front lawn and hunt for it for half an hour. It's the same thing to me. Uh, what I'm saying is if we can have fun solving problems with the golf course, the football field, the baseball diamond and all, why can't we learn to have fun solving problems? And we can in the office, in school, in science, in the home, wherever we are, if we learn the psychology and the principles, which I'm teaching tonight, and I'm writing a book on this topic, by the way, which will be available probably within a year. Tom Watson, at the age of 25, won the 104th British Open Golf Tournament. On what golfers call the toughest golf course in the world in Scotland, Tom Watson at that time was not even expected to be in the finals. He ended up winning. Again, the reporters gathered around, asked what was his mental attitude that enabled him to do it. Tom Watson said, I kept telling myself over and over again in my mind, just give yourself a chance. Just give yourself a chance. Give yourself a chance to be a winner. How many people of whatever age, when something new comes along to learn or do or be or become or explore or think about, do not give themselves a chance. They begin this great long litany of doubts. Oh, I'm too young, too old, not educated enough, too educated, live in the wrong part of the country, we go on and on. Do not give ourselves a chance. Just give yourself a chance. There's some tasks so little, so small, nobody wants to take them on. Now the tasks so great, so big, nobody wants to take them on. Leave some people in great danger of doing absolutely nothing. The big problem with doing nothing, you have absolutely no way of knowing when you're through. <laughs> <laughs> I, for one, would rather try to do something and fail than try to do nothing and succeed. <laughs> you will not leave your footprints on the sands of time by sitting down. <laughs> Would you explain that to the rest of your table over there? <laughs> Someone said, that's hindsight. No. <laughs> well, some people say, well, I'm not doing much with my life, but say, I feel like I'm on the right track. Old railroad man, I'll tell you, you can be on the right track and get run over if you just sit there. One of the most inspiring things I ever read was an obituary in the New York Times some years ago. Didn't expect it to be inspiring to me, but it was. <laughs> this is true. There was an old black folk singer by the name of Josh White who had died. Folk singer and guitar player. Well, I played guitar too, and I have for years, and I had one of his albums. So I read his obituary, and they told just one incident in his life that's forever been emblazoned in my mind. They said on one occasion, Josh White was scheduled to perform before a huge packed auditorium. He'd just begun to sing a long, long folk song with many verses, many choruses to it, when suddenly one of the strings on his guitar snapped in two. But Josh White didn't stop singing and he didn't stop playing. Instead, he nodded his head, signaling an associate of his to bring him a replacement guitar string. Then continuing to strum from time to time on the remaining five unbroken strings, Josh White proceeded to remove the broken string, replace it with the new one, tune it up to proper pitch. The audience sat spellbound by what they were witnessing. He ended up strumming full chords on all six strings. And he finished the song, didn't miss a word or a single beat of it. And the audience gave him a tumultuous standing ovation. And I thought to myself as I read that, if I could have chosen only one night, only one night to have heard old Josh White sing and play, no way would I have chosen a perfect, flawless performance. No, I would have wanted to be there that night. The night the guitar string broke, 
But he didn't stop singing and playing, kept on. He changed it because that symbolizes to me the essence of human greatness, that we rise to our highest heights of achievement, not when things are easy, calm, simple, but responding to a challenge, a problem, a difficulty. A little girl from the country was visiting some of her relatives in the city. They took her to see the zoo. And there, for the first time in her life, she saw a peacock strutting along in all its purple plumage, incandescent color and glory. The little girl went running back to her relatives and said, come quick and look, one of the chickens is in bloom. <laughs> <laughs> That's what a human being is. A human being in bloom, living by this philosophy. When you begin to practice this psychology of exuberant living, you're going to feel better when you feel bad than you used to feel when you felt good. <laughs> 2,000 years ago, the emperor of Rome was one Tiberius Caesar. He was the most powerful and wealthy man on earth. Servants scurried to do his every bidding. The fates of men and nations were settled with a snap of his fingers. He ate from golden plates and he drank from gilded goblets. He was attired in rich and royal raiment. His fingers hung heavy with rings, gems, and precious stones. He was literally the most powerful and wealthy man on earth. But was he happy? You would think so. But I read in the writings of Pliny, the ancient Roman historian, writing about Tiberius Caesar, quote, he was the gloomiest of mankind, end of quote. But during that same time, during the time of Tiberius, there was a young son of a carpenter I read about who journeyed across the land and taught faith and hope and love, the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, the kingdom of God within, that a fragment of infinity, a glowing ember of eternity, a spark of the divine indwells the mortal mind. There's a plan for this planet and a purpose for human life, taught loyalty to supreme values, truth and beauty and goodness, taught love, the love of God and the love of others, and taught the potential of eternal life and the quest for perfection. And just as a bee goes from flower to flower gathering nectar, so we are destined one day to voyage from star to star gathering light. And who on the very night before he was to die declared to his assembled followers, be of good cheer, be of good courage. I have overcome the world. Every great world religion, every great world philosophy is in agreement that the most important things in human life are not the physical, tangible, material things, the things we can touch and taste and feel and smell and hear. No, they're inner things, principles, truths, meanings, values, spiritual things. That these are the most important of all. I will never forget giving a speech, and this is just about a year ago, in Washington. And I'd been talking about this sort of topic. And afterward, people were coming up to shake hands, meet me. And I saw a man in his 40s walking along. He had tears in his eyes, and he was holding his left hand out in front of him. This is a true story. He came up to me. I was curious. He said, Vern, there was something you said in your speech about how a person's life can change, how you can still make something of your life, if you will. And he said, I didn't have a piece of paper to write it down on. So I, I grabbed a ballpoint pen. He said, I started writing it out on the palm of my left hand. But he said, I want to make sure I got it just exactly the way you said it. Would you repeat it to me? And so I repeated for him the idea, God's not so concerned about your ability. God's not so concerned about your inability. God is primarily concerned about your availability, whether you want to learn and grow and change. He wrote that out, amended it, wrote it exactly the way I said it on the palm of his hand. I watched he and his wife walked out the exit, and he was still looking at his left hand. I broadcast these ideas on over a thousand radio stations in all 50 states, Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, the Middle East, and China. I received thousands of letters from people who say, I've tried these principles, these things work. They've changed the quality of my life. My old grandfather, I've alluded to him several times, and I want to say this to grandmothers and grandfathers. My grandparents were the greatest influence on my life. I had wonderful parents, but for some reason, my grandparents reached me and touched me and taught me in a way nobody else ever did. What a mighty mission that is. What a high calling to be a grandparent. My grandfather was, for years, mayor of Emporia, Kansas. C.J. Mose Neal was his name. But as a boy in the late 1800s, he grew up near the old Quinamo Indian tribe in the Meridacene River Valley in the Blue Stem Flint Hills of eastern Kansas. And from those Quinamo Indians, he learned the making of bows and arrows, arrowheads and axe heads, all skills which he taught to me as well. But the best thing he ever taught me was a story, which 
which I shall conclude this evening. He told me that one night, as a boy, he was sitting out at campfire under the white moon and the bright stars with an old Indian he'd met along the way. And as the orange flames dwindled down to luminous coals and embers, their conversation turned to talk of spiritual things and of the one great spirit, God. With a flicker of firebrands dimly illumining the scene, the sounds of the night all about them, this old Indian said, I'll tell you how it is with me, my life. He said, I'm two ways. Sometimes I'm good, sometimes I'm bad. The Indian said, it's as if I had inside of me two dogs, a good dog and a bad dog. And the good dog is noble, strong, courageous, brave, and true, and the bad dog is a mean, vicious, evil, fearful, cur. He said, these two dogs in me always fighting, always struggling, always at each other's throats. The young lad leaned forward, fascinated, and said, but which dog wins the fight? Beyond the quiet crackling of the fire, the evening crickets chirped. Somewhere in the distance, a coyote howled. The old Indian thought for a long, long moment and then replied, The dog I feed wins. The dog I feed wins. The final frontiers of humankind are not the steaming jungles, the dark forests, snow-shimmering mountain ranges. <laughs> Not the unquenched deserts and the endless oceans of this earth, nor even are the final frontiers, the silent stretches of boundless blackness, star to star across the midnight skies. No, the final frontiers are inside us, and the mind, the soul, the spirit, the quest and the finding of God. And that is the ultimate secret of exuberant living. I thank you. God bless you. Good evening. Thank you, Grand Jury.